Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, Mario. Uh, yeah, I'm Sebastian, and I'm one of 15 authors uh, of this attack, which is a bit strange. Uh, so th the, the attack actually developed over more than one year, and it started like a, a little tiny idea of Nimrod and, and me, and we looked at SSL version 2, which is not really relevant, so we just looked at it, and then it kept like exploding and exploding and exploding. It got worse and worse and worse, and now we got a logo and a web page and so on and so on. So. Uh, okay, the exploit chain for Drown is not, uh, mathematically not very difficult, but there's many things which you, or, or several things which you need to understand in order to get a grasp of, of why Drown is really a problem. When I say um, uh, SSL version 2, I'm speaking of 90s crypto, so prehistoric Jurassic cryptography that you see there. There's something like DES, uh, the data encryption standard. There's something like RC4, which just recently died, which was used like uh, for many years. RC2, uh, there's something like MD5. Everyone knows that MD5 is broken and so on and so on. So these were in the 90s. And then within Netscape, they came up with, uh, with a new protocol. SSL version 1 was so bad that they never published it. Right? So there's, there's nothing written down what SSL version, version 1 really did. And then they published SSL version 2, which was like good enough for them to publish it, but bad enough that it was broken within a few months later. Right? So SSL version 2 was published in 94 and was broken, fundamentally broken in 94. And I pictured this something like this, right? So um, SSL version 2, so it was proposed and it died immediately because there's a fundamental problem in SSL version 2, which allows a man in the middle to, uh, to downgrade your Cypher suite. So let's just assume you, uh, you're a client and you speak to a server and you select a 128-bit uh, Cypher suite, which is strong, which is still strong, uh, and the, uh, uh, a man in the middle could downgrade your attack to a very weak Cypher, let's say DES, or an export Cypher or something like this, and you have no way of, of finding out. So the Cypher suite selection is nothing that is authenticated in SSL version 2, and therefore it's fundamentally broken. So we could leave it here, basically. There's really no reason of using SSL version 2. The last browser that supported SSL version 2 was Internet Explorer 6, and it would still never negotiate SSL version 2 if it has the opportunity to use SSL version 3. Right, so SSL, uh, Internet Explorer 6 would still, would still prefer uh, SSL version 3. So it should be gone by now, right? Uh, which it's not quite gone, right? So we have something like a little island. We thought there, there might be a little island, and when we scan the internet, we might find a few SSL version 2 uh, uh, instances so that we can write a paper and at least get something out of, of, of our research. And then we did the scanning, and uh, we were actually quite surprised that SSL version 2 is still prevalent. It's still used on many, many servers. So for example, um, let's start with uh, HTTPS. Uh, we scanned port 443 over the, the, the full internet. We saw approximately 35 million um, servers that supported some kind of SSL or TLS. And out of those, uh, 6 million, which is 17%, we're, we're still happy to negotiate SSL version 2, which is really strange. So 17% is quite high. When you look at SMTP, for example, port 25, we found 3.3 uh, million servers uh, that supported with uh, SSL and TLS, with star TLS, right? Those are only those SMTP servers that support some kind of encryption. And out of those, almost 1 million supported SSL version 2. And you see there's a, there's a difference among protocols. Um, some of them uh, uh, support SSL version 2 quite often. Some of them don't. The reason why for SMTP we see so many SSL version 2 supported servers is um, opportunistic encryption. So basically, especially after Snowden, people were saying we have to use some encryption, even if it's really bad. And uh, SMTP has a plain text fallback so when two SMTP servers speak to each other and, and deliver uh, emails, and they can negotiate a, a SSL or TLS connection, they will fall back to plain text. And, so, and indeed, SSL version 2 is a fundamentally broken uh, protocol, but only for active attackers. So uh, if you have like a PCAP dump, a Wireshark 
uh, a file of an SSL version 2 handshake, it's still very difficult to break it, right? It would be very difficult for an SA to break it. You have to be an active man in the middle. So SSL version 2 is actually better than plain text, and therefore everyone was saying for, for SMTP you have to enable everything. RC4, what, whatever ciphers you got, everything, because everything is better than plain text. And what I'm going to show today is that uh, enabling SSL version 2 is really, really a bad idea, even for opportunistic encryption. Okay. So I already said drown is not, not math mathematically not very difficult, but it's a long exploit chain. And so uh, we thought about what, what are the, the fundamental puzzle pieces that you need to understand for drown. And uh, the first cluster of puzzle pieces are the first three. That is Bleichenbacher's 1989's uh, attack uh, that Jörg Schwenk in the keynote already mentioned. I will give a short introduction to this. Then we present a new protocol flaw in SSL version 2, which is so far unknown, right? It has nothing to do with uh, the, the break that was found in 1994. And uh, we need 40-bit export ciphers. So 40-bit export ciphers is, let's say, a child that was born out of the first crypto wars. So the first crypto wars, the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, uh, like the government of the United States of America said, OK, um, uh, we produce a lot of cryptography. And when we export this to some other countries, we can't even read the stuff that the other countries are sending anymore, which is bad. And so therefore, they said, we, uh, uh, in order to be able to export cryptography, you have to limit its, uh, its strength. And one way to limit its strength is that you limit uh, uh, like cryptography to 40-bit. So the key, maximum allowed key size is 40-bit, which is still supported in SSL version 2. And when we take these three together and blend it a little, we get a practical attack ex against SSL version 2. All right? And this would be like uh, a passive attack. Now, this would be an attack where we can, um, where we can decrypt an SSL version 2 handshake after the fact as a, pa as a passive monitoring uh, person. Then there's a third uh, puzzle piece, which means that our um, uh, uh, not only SSL versions, so SSL version 2, version 3, TLS 1.0, and so on and so on, they use the same key material for the same server. So if you have a server and you allow all the versions, then all versions will use the same key material, which is very interesting. And when we put this puzzle piece to the rest, we can not only break SSL version 2, but we can break uh, all of a sudden all TLS connections. Right? So you observe some kind of TLS connection, and you can break it afterwards under the condition that the server supports SSL version 2. Okay? Now this is, here it gets really interesting. This was the point where we said, OK, now it gets really interesting, because now we, we're using SSL version 2 to, to break something which was actually known to be good. Right? TLS is still known to be, to, to be secret. Um, this is everything now is uh, protocol level. So that means it affects all SSL version 2 implementations. Okay? It's, it's actually a, a flaw in the protocol. But when we uh, put two more puzzle pieces to, uh, uh, to the mix, two implementation errors in OpenSSL, all of a sudden our practical attack, which still involved lots of computing power, um, this attack gets trivial all of a sudden. And trivial means it takes several minutes on this, on this laptop. We don't need a, a big cluster anymore. Right? And, um, and also, uh, it's not only that we have a practical attack at, at, against many TLS servers, but a lot of TLS servers. So we get really, these two implementation errors are like very unfortunate, but uh, they help the attack to make it much more, much more practical. OK. Let's give a short introduction in Bleichenbacher's 1998 attack. Um, there is, uh, like, I, I will give you just the, 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 the idea that you need to understand why this attack really works. It's a padding oracle uh, uh, attack, and it's, it's much fun to implement it. So uh, if you have some time, try to implement it. It's really, really nice. OK, this is an RSA key exchange uh, in TLS. OK, this is not Diffie-Hellman. We don't use perfect forward secrecy. We have a TLS client on the left, a TLS server on the right, and the TLS client starts a uh, TLS handshake with, with a so-called client hello uh, uh, message. Um, the server responds 
with a server hello, and with a server hello, it sends his uh, TLS certificate. And this TLS certificate uh, contains an RSA public key, which is very important. Uh, and in the next step, the, the, the client does something which is uh, very important for the security of, of TLS overall, for this key exchange. Uh, the client generates a random pre-master secret. And this pre-master secret is some kind of a session key, right? And uh, uh, it, it generates a random uh, session key, then encrypts it with the RSA public key that was in the certificate, sends it over to the server. The server decrypts it because he has, he has the private key, right? So he decrypts it. So a, a client and server have, has the same, they have the same uh, uh, session key and can speak AES together, for example. Right. So this is the asymmetric uh, key exchange that is used over RSA, and everything from there will be encrypted using AES. That means symmetric encryption, for example. Okay. Uh, if if someone records this key exchange and all the data that is sent afterwards, and he can afterwards break this client key exchange, this encrypted session key. If he can break it, you can break like you can decrypt simply decrypt all the data that was transferred, which is. Uh, uh, something that happened, for example, to LavaBit. So if someone steals your private key from your TLS server, you can, you can uh, years after that, you can still decrypt all the traffic that you have recorded. So it's basically everything rises and falls with this client key exchange. If you can break it, you can break the TLS even afterwards. Okay. So this pre-master secret is a, it's a session key. It's a f used for symmetric encryption, and symmetric encryption uses shorter keys than uh, than asymmetric encryption. So in the case of TLS, uh, it uh, uses uh, this is the session key here. It's 46 bytes. Uh, uh, 0301 is the uh, uh, the version of TLS that is used. This is TLS 1.0, and um, then you, you you need to use padding because RSA is a block cipher, so when you have a 2,000-bit key, you can always only encrypt 2,000-bit, okay? So you need to have some padding, and the padding that is used here is PKCS1 in version 1.5, and this says it, it starts with a 0, 0, 0, 0002. Uh, then we have random padding, and the random padding must not have, must not contain a zero, because the zero, the zero byte here is the delimiter between padding and the actual content. Okay, and this is a very easy uh, padding scheme that is used in TLS. Okay, what is important is RSA is uh, not uh, uh, so it's it's basically an integer, right? It's a number. It's not a bit field. It's not treated as a bit field, but it's a very very big number. And uh, so when you know that this number starts with a zero 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 two, you have boundaries. Right? So you know a boundary within, within which this particular, um, uh, within this particular integer right now is. Okay. So now Bleichenbacher's attack has a, like a very interesting observation. Um, uh, with Bleichenbacher's attack, the attacker has already captured an RSA key exchange. This is what you see here. So the attacker just watches a TLS RSA key exchange and records it. He does nothing more. He doesn't change anything. Then he uses the, uh, the pre-master secret, the encrypted pre-master secret, and tries to, to decrypt it by making changes to it and then sending it over to the server. Um, and the, the, fundamental, the fundamental puzzle piece for, uh, for Bleichenbacher's attack is um, the, you need to have an oracle, which is in this case the server, which decrypts uh, the pre-master secret and tells you whether the modified pre-master secret has a correct padding. So, for example, it starts with 0002. There's, there are other checks, but this is the most important thing. And if you know this, then you can derive some information from, this, from the clear text that, that, just, that just came out of this decryption. Because you know that the oracle, uh, like the, the interval between this, uh, the, the plain text is, is between uh, 2b and 3b, and the 2 and the 3 comes from the 0, 0, 0, 0002 thing there, right? So you learn that this is, uh, this is, um, uh, this is the, uh, uh, like the interval between, uh, uh, between which this, this uh, clear text is. 
And now you repeat this. So, and with each uh, each time where um, the oracle says yes, this the padding was correct, you learn you learn a few more bits of the actual clear text. So it was called uh, the million questions attack. So you needed one million requests in order to find out the, the clear text. But in the meantime, between 1998 and now, it's almost 20 years. Uh, there were uh, several papers were published where this is down to a few thousand requests, depending on what the oracle checks and so on and so on. Okay. So we need to know the Bleichenbacher's attack. We know that we can construct a padding oracle where we can send an arbitrary ciphertext and it will tell us whether the, the resulting plain text was correctly padded or not. That's the Bleichenbacher oracle, which is, which is known, right? And there's implementations on GitHub for, for this, so this is something that just simply works. Now we want to introduce a new flaw for SSL version 2, and before we do that, I want to show you how the SSL version 2 protocol actually looks like. Uh, it looks similar to, to, to this of TLS, which I just showed you, just with a, with a few minor tweaks. So uh, with TLS, um, you will send, the client will send the list of supported ciphers to the server, right? It will send a list of supported ciphers to the server. With TLS, the server just picks one cipher suite that, that he supports and, uh, and, and begins with that. Uh, with SSL version 2, it's, um, uh, you have one more round trip here. So here you get a list of supported cipher suites that the client supports. The uh, server picks the, out of this cipher, cipher suite list, it picks those which the server also supports, but it's still a list, uh, sends it back to the server, uh, I'm sorry, to the client, and then the client selects a cipher suite. Okay. Um, this here, the client master key, is something like the pre-master secret. It just has a different name, but the concept is very similar. Um, then it generates the actual session key and so on and so on. And what is now very important, and this is a difference to TLS, the server will immediately send uh, the so-called server verify message. With uh, TLS, uh, I will just quickly go back in order to show you this. Uh, with TLS, you have here the client key exchange, and then the client will send a finished message. And this finished message contains uh, some kind of message authentication code, and it proves that uh, it just it, it knows the plain text of the of the pre-master secret that it just sent. So it, it's some kind of authentication step, which here is not the case. So what this means is. Um, let's assume we're the Bleichenbacher attacker and we send a modified uh, ciphertext to the server. Then we, the server will decrypt it and it will send us immediately the server verify message, which is encrypted with this session key. Okay? So we just know that the server verify is encrypted with this, uh, with this session key. We don't know the key, but we know the plain text. So the plain text of server verify is actually this challenge that was sent by the client. And that's a server authentication step. So the server here proves that it could successfully uh, uh, decrypt the session key, the pre-master secret if you want, then construct the session key from it, then encrypt uh, this challenge that the client just sent and uh, yeah, that it can do that. And this is, very, this is some very interesting information, right? Let's just keep this in mind. There's one more puzzle piece, uh, and, and I will soon put them together, and then, then I hope you will understand why we need these uh, three puzzle pieces. The third puzzle piece that we need in order to make a practical attack is uh, these uh, export ciphers with 40-bit. Uh, this is how a SSL and TLS cipher suite looks like. So uh, uh, you, fr from this here, you learn that the RC2 cipher uh, will be used which is like the little brother of RC4. It's a block cipher, not a stream cipher. Uh, it uses 128 bits in a CBC mode of operation, but now something curious happens. Uh, it tells you, okay, there's export 40. And export 40 means that out of these 128 bits, only 40 are secret. Right? I told you that the session key, this pre-master secret, uh, will be sent by the client encrypted to the server. 
And usually this would be 128 bit would, would be encrypted, sent to the server. But in this case, when you have export ciphers, only uh, 40 of those. So 88 bit are sent in the clear. And it looks like this uh, in SSL speak. The pre-master secret is here actually the master secret MK. And it's simply a concatenation. So you have uh, with for 40, uh, for 40 bit ciphers, uh, it would mean that MK clear is 88 bit long and MK secret is 40 bit long. And both are concatenated, but the first, um, these one are sent in the clear and only those are, are, are encrypted and sent over to the, uh, to the server. So most of the key is actually sent in clear, okay? And therefore much more easy to break and, and now I hope it makes sense uh, like why the government did this, okay? Now, SSL also supports non-export ciphers, and there the length of MKClear is, is simply zero. So there's simply, this is simply an empty string, okay? Nothing of the key will be sent in a clear, therefore it has key strings 128-bit uh, in this case. Okay. Okay, so this is good. So now we have, uh, we, we don't, and on, on this time, we don't yet know whether the padding that, uh, of, of the master key that we just sent over to the server was correct or not. We don't know this yet. Just we know, um, we know the attacker now knows the plain text because it was this random, random challenge that the client just sent. And uh, he knows the plain text, he knows the cipher text, but he wants the key. When he knows the key, he learns something about uh, he learns something about the premaster secret and of the padding. Okay. The important thing is we can find out the key for export ciphers because it's only 40 bit, and 40 bit is something which we can brute force on on common hardware. Right? I will I will dive deeper into this what what hardware we used, but 40 bit is something that we that we can indeed brute force today. Okay. So we can find out the the key which is very important, and why this is important, I hope this becomes clear right here. So, uh, Jörg, Jörg Schwenk in the keynote already said, Leichenbacher's attack was never really fixed in the TLS protocol. There's more like in the RFCs, they, they give an implementation advice. They unify the, the error messages, so uh, a, 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 concurrent t a, a current TLS server will not tell you whether the padding was, uh, was wrong or not. It will just simply tell you something went wrong, right? So something went wrong and we don't know whether it was padding or it was, was something difficult, uh, was something different. And uh, what they do then is uh, actually in case that uh, the, the padding was not valid, they generate a, a, a random pre-master secret and just continue in a, in a flow. The reason for this is um, uh, they want to provoke, uh, this leads to the fact that client and server will have different session keys. And then they try to speak to each other and, and, and they get garbage and, and then this, this general error comes out, okay? TLS 1.0 said, in case the padding is not correct, for example, it doesn't start with 0002, uh, then we generate a random premaster secret and proceed with this random premaster secret and then make an error later in the, uh, in, in the handshake. This is a very interesting timing leak which we exploited in our 2014 paper um, because when we make very exact timing measurements, uh, we send over a, a cipher text and if the padding was not correct, it will generate a premaster secret which takes a few microseconds which we can, which we can measure and then from this we get a we get a Bleichenbacher oracle. They fixed this in TLS 1.2 by saying we always generate a, a random premaster secret, and only if the decrypted premaster secret was uh, was not correctly padded, we just use this. So there's a, more like an assignment, but the actual gen generation of the premaster secret is done always, right? Which means the timing leak is closed. But one thing that is very interesting here. Um, Invalid padding always results, results in a random premaster secret. Okay, and this hopefully makes sense from this slide. So we don't send the same uh, uh, encrypted premaster secret to the server once, but twice. Okay, so we send the same encrypted premaster secret that we now want to break twice to the server. Now, under the condition that the premaster secret is valid. Both keys of the server verify 
will be the same because no random premaster secret was chosen. Okay, the padding was correct, so it extracted the encrypted premaster secret and went on with it in, in the handshake. If the premaster secret is invalid, then we got two server verify, and both uh, server verify were done with a different key. And that we can find out, it's 40 bit, right? So we can simply brute force the 40 bit, and from this we get a Bleichenbacher oracle, okay? So we do, this, uh, uh, just to repeat it once more, we send the same uh, encrypted premaster secret twice to the same server. We get two server verifies, and if both server verifies were constructed with the same, um, with the same key, we know that the PMS was valid. Otherwise, if two keys were used for the server verify, we know uh, that the PMS was invalid because we have a random premaster secret. Okay, so this is nice. This is a nice observation uh, uh, that is located only in SSL version 2 and is actually a Bleichenbacher oracle that is so far, so far unknown. Okay, just a few uh, numbers that we give here. Uh, in order that Drown really works, we need to collect 1,000 TLS handshakes and we can only break one of them. So we need to uh, collect approximately 1,000 and this one, there's uh, approximately one uh, uh, handshake in there that we can, that we can break. So it's, it's not that we can break each and every one, we can only break one, of, one out of uh, 1,000, but this basically only means that we have to watch the, the victim long enough, okay? Well, for example, if you have an email program that will uh, uh, retrieve your email over TLS, we just have to wait for a few days until Right, because it will, uh, it will regularly check the email, make new TLS connections, and so on, and so on. Then we need to perform around 40,000 SSL version 2 handshakes, which is not much. You can, done, you can do this in a few seconds, actually. And now comes the, most, the, the, the very expensive part. We need to perform approximately 2 to the 50 export cipher encryptions. Right? And uh, 2 to the 50 uh, is actually 2 to the 40, but 1,000 times. So we have like approximately 1,000 TLS handshakes, and, um, and yeah, so the overall complexity is 2 to the 50, which is involved, but I'll, I'll get into this uh, uh, a little later. Okay, so let's speak about shared keys among uh, SSL versions. So basically TLS, neither TLS nor SSL offers a way of uh, where you can hand out different certificates depending on, S on the TLS version. So there's no possibility to say, I want to, for TLS 1.0, I want this certificate, and if the client speaks uh, TLS 1.2, for example, I want to use another, secret, uh, another uh, certificate. So basically, the same certificate and the same um, uh, RSA key material is, um, is used for all SSL and TLS versions. Right, and and basically you see this uh, uh, you see this in detail that there are many systems on the internet where you see they have SSL version two enabled uh, up to TLS 1.2, right, and the same is valid for different protocols, so SMTP, IMAP, POP3, HTTPS, XMPP, for example, they all use or, or have the capability of using TLS. And um, uh, when they use, like when you have one system where the email server and the HTTPS server uses the same RSA keys, then we can abuse this in a, in a very interesting way because we can say if 10 systems share one certificate and share the same RSA key material and only one of those 10 uh, systems is vulnerable to drown, then we can break connections to all 10 of these systems because they use the same key material. Okay, and this is really devastating. I have, um, this is just a, a picture where, where I just want to uh, tell you this. So let's assume you have like a TLS connection to a single server that is vulnerable to drown because it uh, uh, supports SSL version 2, then you can obviously break it. You can obviously break this TLS connection. But what I'm saying here and the point I'm trying to make is uh, here the, our attacker observes a TLS connection to one server and then there's another server, both have the same RSA keys, the same certificates, and only this one uh, uses SSL version 2, then you, can, uh, use, then you can break this TLS connection to this system by making the drone attack to this system, which is, quite, which is quite strange. You can even load balance. 
right? So when you have like several thousand systems using the same certificate, and uh, what I think the the top system, the top certificate that was vulnerable to drown was used by a half a million systems, right? There's, you can you can load balance the attack, right? When you when you don't want to spend forty thousand connections to a single system, you can load balance it to to all the others. They just have to use the same certificate. Okay, so. So we measured this. We did some, some scanning. And um, so how you read this table is it works like this. So you, here you have the ports on the x-axis, and here you have the ports on the, on the y-axis. And uh, uh, you read it like this. So of all the certificates that we saw on the internet on port 25, 18% of those certificates are also used on HTTPS. And now that's an important point, because I just told you SMTP the, the SSL configuration of SMTP is much worse than those of, of HTTP. Right? Peop, all, peop, all the people look on, uh, look, on load, look on HTTP, but when they use the same certificates, but different configurations, then we can break HTTPS connections by doing the drone attack against SMTP, for example, under the condition that they use the same certificate. Okay. Now, and the increase that we get from this is really enormous. So um, we just learned a few slides earlier that 28% of all SMTP servers are vulnerable to drown. But when we take into account all the systems that run a certificate that is somehow, somewhere on the internet exposed via a, uh, 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 a uh, drown vulnerable server, then this number rises significantly, and in this case, uh, here it was almost 1 million, and it rises to 1.7 million. So there's a huge increase that we just have um, by, uh, by basically looking, or by basically marking a certificate as vulnerable if it is used by a single server that is vulnerable to drown. So only 28 of all SMTP servers are vulnerable to drown, but 50% um, of all SMTP servers, the connections to them can be broken because the certificate that is used is somewhere else on some other port somewhere in the world used uh, on a system that is vulnerable to drown. So this really scales, scales up quite a lot. Okay. So I told you um, the attacker needs, has, the attack has a complexity of 2 to the 50. So we need, to, uh, we need to perform these 2 to the 50 exhaustive uh, searches approximately 1,000 times. So that's why we have 2 to the 50. And uh, we, uh, we, we use several ways of finding out how can we do this brute forcing in the most efficient way. And basically what we used is uh, we had a cluster of CPUs, we had a cluster of GPUs, and here at the RUP we had a cluster of, F of H uh, FPGAs. And we basically implemented the attack with the source code that we, that we stole from OpenSSL. Right? So we, we took MD5 and we took the RC4 cipher, constructed everything with 40-bit, with and then we got some numbers, and then we, um, we thought about, okay, let's, let's talk to people who are really good at brute forcing. And the first thing that comes to your mind is the Hashcat team. They do password brute forcing, and they're very, very good at this. And this is what you see here. Um, with the platform, there's something called naive, and there's an optimized <laughs> thing. And uh, so basically, we send our code, our naive implementation of the attack to uh, Jens Stoiber, Atom of Hashcat. Uh, and basically, overnight, he improved the code with, by a factor of 20. Right? So the time was reduced by a factor of 20, which is really, really, really amazing. Okay? And so um, he offered us to, to use the Hashcat cluster. So Team Hashcat uses, they have like a huge cluster of, uh, of different GPUs. And we used this. And uh, we also ran it on Amazon. And there we found that we can break a single TLS connection for uh, $440. Uh, the Hashcat cluster costs approximately $18,000 if you, if you would buy it. But that's flat rate. Right? So, uh, $440 is basically a single, uh, breaking a single or performing a single drone attack, and this is uh, like 18,000 is like the flat rate. And you can break it within three fourths of a day, so that's like 18 hours or so, okay, per connection. Okay, now this was drawn. Um, what I want to talk to you now, uh, what I want to explain to you is two implementation errors in OpenSSL. Um, and the important part is it's only SSL version 2. 
So basically, we, we, we spoke to a lot of uh, uh, OpenSSL core developers, and most of them were saying, OK, I've never actually looked at this code, because nobody's using it anymore. Right? So, so it was, they, sh they were shipping code they, were, they considered dead, that nobody's using anymore, and therefore nobody looked at it anymore. But when we submitted patches, people were like, OK, so um, uh, I've never actually looked at it. I need some time in order to learn the code. OK, so the, the first one is what we call the Cypher Suite selection bug. And I told you with, um, with SSL version 2, the client sends a list of supported Cypher Suites. Then the server takes uh, out of this list a new list of the Cypher Suites that he supports as well. And then the client chooses one. So we have two lists that go, that go back and forth. And um, what is generally possible is um, a very weird thing, I find. Uh, it's in general possible to support SSL version 2, but no SSL version 2 Cypher Suites. Protocol and Cypher Suites are two different things. And so basically, when you have SSL version 2 enabled, but no Cypher Suite of SSL version 2, any standard conforming client will tell you, yeah, it supports SSL version 2, but I can't negotiate any Cypher and it will just close the connection. Which is OK. So most people configure their, uh, configure their Cypher suites, but not the protocol. And now there's a very interesting bug in, um, in OpenSSL. Basically, I, as a client, send a list of the supported ciphers, and I include the export ciphers. Remember, we need the export ciphers. Then I get a list back of the server, and it tells me, OK, I support SSL version 2 ciphers, but no export ciphers, because they are no good. And then I, as, a, as the attacker, non-conforming client, I say, yeah, OK, great. I, I want to negotiate an, an export 40 uh, a cipher suite, and then the server will just accept it. Which is, which is basically, OK, you have a system, uh, and you configure your OpenSSL, and you say it's a very secure list of Cypher suites that you only support. You have just forgotten to, to tell it minus SSL version 2. Then this system will be vulnerable if you have a non-conforming client, and it's vulnerable to drown. Right? And a substantial amount of, of systems on the internet, they had SSL version 2 enabled but in a way that no standard-conforming SSL version 2 client would be able to negotiate a handshake. Okay? So it's not a big issue. Most scanners were saying, no, it's not a big issue. But because of this bug, because of this open SSL bug, it is an issue. Okay. The second one, um, so we spent a lot of time on brute forcing the 2 to the 50 complexity. A lot of time. Really many months were spent doing this. And uh, until we found Special Drown, which was someone, uh, somewhere in, uh, in February, so very late before we, before we went public. And this works, this works like this. I told you the 40-bit uh, export ciphers are strange, because uh, you have 128-bit keys. A part of it is shipped in clear. A part of it will be, will be encrypted. So only part of the 128-bit is, uh, exactly, is, is exactly secure. Now, um, this is like the construction. It's more like a, uh, a, a string concatenation. This is, these are the clear bits. These are the secret bits. The actual encryption key is the server write key. And it uses MK. Uh, it uses an MD5 hash. That's not relevant. And it uses MK, but it only uses the first 16 byte. Whatever is the first 16 byte will be used. Now, uh, what? Now, let's just say you, you have a 128-bit um, uh, cipher suite selected. Then uh, all the key bits, all the key bytes will be, will be used in, in the actual hash, which is good. But when you use a non-export cipher, non-export cipher, and you still send uh, uh, secret bits, then something very strange happens. The four bits are uh, like prepended. The first four bytes are the ones that were sent in a clear. And uh, here, this, uh, the secret bits, uh, secret bytes, there are still 16 bytes in there because it's a non-export cipher. But the last four bytes are somehow truncated, right? Because I told you, this here will just use the first, first 16 byte. So we have effectively cut off four byte of, of the full key. And now when I do 15 uh, clear bits, uh, 15 clear bytes, sorry, um, we basically have only one byte of the secret of the secret key here, and that we can brute force. 
So when I negotiate a SSL version 2 handshake and I send 15 bytes of the clear, which I know, 15 zero bytes or 15 one bytes, doesn't really matter, um, then I get a server verify and the server verify of the server verify there is only a 128 bit or 200 or sorry it's actually only 8 bit here that is really unknown and that I can brute force right on average I only need 128 byte uh, uh, tries and then I know k1 and from this I can learn each and every byte successively Right? So basically, it's, it's like I can, I can scooch over uh, each byte and then just brute force the single byte. I can learn byte by byte by simply sending 15, um, uh, 15 padding bytes and, and so on and so on. So basically, a generic drone had 2 to the 50 complexity. Special drone only requires 15 probe connections and on average 15 times 128. Um, like eight bits are 256 possibilities. On average, I will uh, I will find this uh, the solution in 128 tries. So we only need uh, 2,000 tri uh, trial encryptions and not two to the 40, which is a bit unfortunate because we'd spent so many months uh, in order to uh, to make this really fast. But yeah, okay, it's only a a, a open SSL bug and it's closed, obviously. What is very interesting is um, uh, this bug was closed last year, in 2015, already, and nobody knew, so it was a silent fix. So we submitted a, um, we submitted a, uh, a patch to a bug that was closed, and on the way, Emilia of OpenSSL fixed another bug, which she didn't see and we didn't see, and that was basically this bug. What is interesting here, we scanned for this particular bug and we found that a substantial amount is still vulnerable also for this, uh, for this special drone. So what you see here, uh, of all the hosts on the internet, on port 25, 28% are uh, vulnerable to, to generic drone. They support SSL version 2. But 25% uh, obviously run a open SSL version that is more than one year old because it was fixed in March 2015. Which is telling about how people patch their systems, which doesn't seem to be at all. Right? So basically, most of the systems that we found uh, that support SSL version 2 are open SSL that is more than one, one year old, which is pretty bad. Okay, I'm, I'm running out of time, I think. Um, uh, I just wanted to show you that like, we, we created a logo, we created a, a web page, and runatech.com got a lot of visitors. So this was really interesting. So only on the, um, like, let's say on the, four, on the first uh, four days, we almost had uh, uh, f uh, half a million unique people on, on, on the system, which is very interesting because so many people wanted to look at how this, how this attack worked, which was also quite interesting. So runatech.com was hosted at University, uh, uh, Münster University of Applied Sciences, so in my university. And uh, so we went online at uh, 1, 1 p.m. and on, uh, uh, on, on 3.30, uh, a DDoS uh, attack uh, was started against uh, droneattack.com, which I only found out because nothing was working anymore, so the whole Fachhochschule was, was off the net. And um, so the Fachhochschule is connected to the university, so we use the uplink of the university, and so the University of Münster was also down. And so basically, yeah, now everyone knows me in, uh, in Münster, which is a pity. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>